Hello everyone and welcome back to Urban Crest Online. We are so happy that you guys have chosen Urban Crest as your place of worship today. We have a very special guest today. Nick Ripkin is here with us today and he is going to bring the word. He is a missionary and well-known author of the Insanity of God book. Before we hear the word, we're going to worship and engage with our Lord today because he is worthy of all the praise and all the honor. So let's get up from our seats, from your bed, wherever you are, and let's go before him. Come as you are, and let's raise our hands and lift our voices to the one who is worthy of all praise and worship. Hallelujah, my weapon is 
blessed assurance Jesus is mine oh what a foretaste of glory divine heir of salvation purchase of God
Good morning. I'm Nick Ripkin, and we're so glad to be here along with my uh, wife, Ruth. One of the things that you uh, might need to know about Ruth and myself is that we're both PKs. She's a pastor's kid, and I'm a pagan's kid. And that really gives us uh, the gifts that's n that we've needed for the last 35 years overseas. You see, Ruth cannot remember not knowing Jesus. She cannot remember not having uh, workers from overseas around her breakfast table and her, uh, and her dinner table. Now, for me, uh, I was 18 years of age, and I had no clue what would happen to me when I died. I had no clue about the purpose of life. And uh, I, I can remember reading uh, the Bible for the first time and reading Jesus's commission to go into all the world and thinking how great that might be to get out of rural Kentucky. But Ruth knows what to do when we get before people who have never heard about the gospel. What, what I bring to the table is I know what it's like to be 18 years of age and never have anybody look for me nor my family. Now, what I'd like to do with you this morning is to speak to you from the heart of God of what he's doing uh, among the nations. And I want to look at Matthew 10, but especially in Matthew 11 with you, because in Matthew 10, Jesus pushes a reset button. Can you imagine all that Israel tried to be as far as the wealth and armies, and, and might, and power. And here comes the Son of God, and he says in Matthew 10, I'm going to send you out as sheep among the wolves. Who does that? We don't. Uh, I, 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 got a, uh, I have a, a bachelor's and a master's and a doctorate from theological and, and Baptist schools across Kentucky. And I promise you, they poured into me how to be a sheep among sheep. And therefore, when I got to a place like Somalia, where the wolves were full time, it was very difficult. And I learned that I can say something to you this morning that I can't say to 70% of the people on this earth. And that is for you. Uh, in your Bible studies, in your worship service, even in your homes, where you're listening like not right now, perhaps, that the altar of God is open. There's been a place created for you by this church, by the Holy Spirit, where you can come to Jesus and encounter him. I can't say that to 70% of the people on the earth. It'd be a lie. It would not be true. For over 2 billion, closer to 3 billion people, they have no access to the kingdom of God. And that's what Jesus is addressing, why he's resetting the kingdom of God in Matthew 10. He says we're going to have to do this differently. And he was so serious that later on in Matthew 10, he says, you're even going to be arrested by the secular authorities, by the sacred authorities, and they're going to persecute and do bad things to you. And Jesus said, but you go, I'm sending you as a witness to them. Can you imagine that? That Jesus was so concerned about everyone from the lowest to the highest levels having an altar open to them that he said, I am willing to send my children into tough places, even to places where they'll be arrested so that people will have an altar available to them, a place where they can access Almighty God. Now, what I didn't expect is that how quickly that Jesus would see this applied in the life of his best friend, John the Baptist. By the time you get to Matthew chapter 11, John the Baptist in, is in prison because of proclaiming truth to Herod. And John is hours, maybe days, but perhaps hours away from losing his head, losing his life. He's going to be killed. Why? For being good, not for being bad. This is, this is something from the scriptures that uh, American congregations and believers don't understand. We generally believe 
that if you are in prison, in jail, if you've been arrested, you deserve to be so. For most of the places that Ruth and I have lived for the last 35 years, you are as likely to be arrested for being good as you are for being bad. Such is the biblical story. John the Baptist did not, his crime for opening an altar in the wilderness for the forgiveness of sins that people could access the kingdom of God. But John has a problem. Like the hundreds of believers we've been with, particularly in Islam, when your back is against the wall, when it's costing you your family, costing you your health, maybe costing you your life, there's a question you want to answer. And John wanted that question answered. He, he heard what Jesus was doing. And he sent his disciples to Jesus and asked Jesus the most strange question. Are you the Messiah or do I wait for somebody else? Why, why would John answer, ask this question? He's the nearest thing to a pastor that Jesus ever had. He baptized him. He prepared the way. He announced his coming. And now that his life is going to be given, not taken, for the kingdom of God, he wants to know, are you truly the Messiah? And listen to Jesus's answer. He did not use any of the big phrases or words, perhaps, that you might be taught in a seminary about if somebody asks you at lunch today, prove to me that Jesus is the Messiah. What are you going to say? How are you going to answer? Jesus is resetting the kingdom of God. He says, you go back and tell John what you hear and what you see, that the blind receive sight, the lepers are cleansed, the lame are walking, the deaf are hearing, uh, that the dead are being raised and lives are changed so much that the gospel is even being preached to the poor. Listen to me, brother and sisters. When Jesus offered up proof that he was the Messiah, the Son of God. He said, it's proved by what you and what I do with Jesus in the marketplace outside of anything you might call a church, whether it's in a, a building where we gather or in your home. The altar of God is open to you. I can't say that to most of the world. We met this young lady in Central Asia uh, in her mid-20s. Uh, she had a dream. Uh, when Muslims dream of the Bible, and we've talked uh, to almost 300 of them in every, almost every Muslim country of the world who have come to Christ, when they dream of a Bible, it's always a blue book. Now, what you're hearing me talk about and how Chinese and Hindus, East Asians, and, and Muslims are coming to Christ, is, is uh, there are few or no workers. There are few or no Bibles. 63% uh, of them cannot read or write a word. There is no Jesus film. There's no TV or radio programs. There is no altar that's open, no access. So what would you expect God to do when we have been disobedient and haven't gone to open up that place where they can encounter the Holy Spirit and the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. That was her environment. Uh, there was no altar. So uh, God, as he does, 93% of the Muslims that we've listened to have come to Christ. Their pilgrimage toward Jesus starts with dreams and visions. Dreams and visions are normal for Muslims. What's miraculous is that God breaks in and changes the content and they dream of this blue book. They hear Gabriel uh, uh, talk about the gospel and seeking Jesus. They'll see a man clothed in white uh, uh, in a bright light with scars in his uh, hands and his feet and his side and scars in his brow. And this person will announce to them in their language, in their language, that he is Jesus, the Messiah, that they are to find him and to believe in him. Dreams and visions don't save anybody. Only Christ saves. We have often met Muslims who have walked to one, two, and three countries looking for someone like you, trying to find someone like me 
who can answer their dreams or answer the question about what they're reading in that blue book. Uh, at her breakfast table, she told her family about her dream and they were perplexed at not that she had the dream, but at its context. And uh, two weeks later, her father, strong man uh, in the business world and in the mosque, uh, called her into his office, had her shut and locked the door. And she stood at attention before his desk and he unlocked a drawer in the bottom of his desk and took out a burlap wrap something and he unwrapped it, and in that burlap was the blue book. And he gave it to her, but he wouldn't let go of it. And he said, my daughter, this is a dangerous book. It can get you hurt because of your dream. It's obvious that God, Allah wants you to have this book, but you be careful with it. But she wasn't. Most Muslims, secondly, after having dreams and visions, will read the Bible if they are literate. And in places like rural Yemen and rural Afghanistan, 90% of them cannot read or write a word. And the only way they're going to hear about the kingdom of God is from another woman like you. Like you, single, married, older. Uh, how else are they going to hear if you don't come, if you don't go, if you don't share? And, and here she is reading that book and she reads it one time, two times, very normal for Muslims to read the Bible from cover to cover three to five times. And in the third time of reading, as much as anyone can by themselves, where previously there was no clear altar open for her uh, through her dreams, uh, through reading the word of God, she found forgiveness for her sins and gave her life to Christ and by the time we caught up with her, uh, she had led over 26 Muslim women to Christ. We haven't seen that anywhere in the world. And the Taliban that defines her environment had a fatwa, a death sentence against her for three reasons. One, because she had converted to Christianity. Two, in their words, she was converting others. And, and three, she was having Taliban men arrested for molesting women in the refugee camps and taken to the court of law. She's a dangerous woman. Spiritually, in the physical world, where Christ has changed her. When we met her, the United Nations was looking to relocate her uh, to America, and we begged her to stay. You're saying, how can you do that? And she said to me, Uncle Nick, you know they're they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna hunt me down. I said, that's that's they're already doing that. Uncle Nick, they're, 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 they might beat me. I said, that's a clear possibility. They, they might put me in jail. And, and we talked about those biblical stories that are like her story. And she said, this might cost me my life. I said, what if you're staying here? What if, what if the souls, the eternal destiny of the women of your people group are contingent on your staying here? Well, they uh, packed her up put her on a plane, relocated her to St. Louis, Missouri before I got home on a furlough to my wife and kids. But uh, what I want you to hear right now from her story is the, is the altar that this woman had opened for her by the power of the Holy Spirit and that she immediately opened to others. If Jesus is proven by what God is doing with us in the marketplace, uh, she's a clear example of how he's using Muslims. They're having dreams and visions. They're reading the Bible through. God is sending someone like he sent uh, Joseph to Pharaoh, Ananias uh, to Saul, uh, Philip to the Ethiopian eunuch. What's God doing in the marketplace? We can take you three places in India where we're seeing uh, Hindus, rural, low caste Hindus who are coming to Christ and being baptized by the tens of thousands, if not weekly, at least monthly. Uh, now, uh, now uh, their pathway, their, their altar is quite different. Young uh, Hindu men who have converted are going by their fours and six, sixes and eights to these Hindu village, villages. They're asking them, how many of you are sick? And everybody's hand is going up. One doctor. 
one medical person for every one to two million low caste Hindus. Ladies, you will never, never understand what a mother will do to her child physically to drive out the demons they believe is in that child's body because they have no access even to an aspirin. How many of you are sick? Hands are raised. How many of you want to be healed? All those hands are raised. And in Jesus' name, just like we read in Matthew 11, the blind see, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, dead raised, and the, the poorest of the poor, certainly in that country, are having access to the kingdom of God. That's what God is doing in the marketplace through the faithfulness of young, usually young men, Hindu evangelists, who through miracles of healing are opening an altar to God. Like dreams and visions, miracles do not, miracles of healing do not bring salvation, but they'll change your direction, change your focus. Have you looked toward Jesus, who is the author, the Bible says, and the finisher of our faith? What's Jesus? is doing in the marketplace. Oh, go to East Asia. The first house group leaders that I met with were about 150 in a compound somewhere 17 hours out in the country. I still don't know where they took me. Uh, uh, they said to me, uh, Dr. Ripken, 40% of us are in prison right now. Pastors, deacons, elders, evangelists, church planters. They said prison for us in East Asia is our theological seminary. And, and then they sort of laughed and they smiled at me. And they said, now that you're here, uh, how many degrees would you like to get in East Asia? And I said, well, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, Ruth needs me back at home. And otherwise, you know, I might consider your degree. Folks, I watched them. I got up one morning and, and walked among them. They're sitting on the ground with some books in their lap and I could see they're tearing the pages out of them and, and it just ripped my heart out. Also, when I saw they're tearing their Bibles into shreds and the interpreter saw the pain on my face and came running over, he said, it's not what you think. You see, I'd been interviewing, learning from them for 14 hours a day, then teaching the book of Luke uh, story by story at night from 10 to 3 o'clock in the morning. And here uh, they had 150 leaders and at that time seven Bibles among them. And they became so hungry to be able to go completely, not just through all those stories they've memorized, but to have every word of Luke in front of them that they vowed unto God that everyone went home with at least one book of the Bible. And so they look at this pastor and ask him if he had Genesis. He said, no, they carefully tear it out and give it to him. And they'd ask this evangelist, do you have the gospel of John? If he said, no, they uh, carefully tear it out and give it to him. They ask one young lady, have you sung the hymn book of the Bible? And she said, well, I didn't know we had one. And they tore the Psalms out and she took it back to her house churches. And I remember feeling so sorry for the leader that got third John. Can you imagine your partner getting the book of John, the gospel, and you getting a half a page or getting Philemon or something like that? But I, I watched them. I watched them. They change the days of the week they meet. They don't meet in groups larger than 30. Persecution gets worse. They meet in groups of 15. It gets more intense. They'll just meet as a family group. They'll change the house that they meet in the day of the week, the time of the day, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll do everything they can, uh, to stay ahead of the persecutors and still 40% of them are in jail. I watched them across that eastern border of China and the other country where a family of four sat with their knees touching one another. And when they sang the songs, they would move their lips and not let any sound come out. Because if someone heard them singing out the window, through the door, through the paper thin walls of the apartment, uh, there's going to be a security policeman at your house at night and three generations of your family will go to labor camp. That's not old history. That's today's history. How do you open an altar of God 
in a place where the persecutors are so fierce. Jesus said, I'm sending you as sheep among wolves. He knew what he was talking about. Israel had become where the, the good news of the Old Testament was just for racially for one people. And they, they kept it among themselves and only a few men could access that holy of holies. And, and here you now have Jesus exploding and opening altars of God. What is Jesus doing in the marketplace? You see, what I've done is quickly try to open a window to you of what God is doing today to make himself known. It's a lot of work. But then those East Asian brothers and sisters asked me about you. And I described what we're doing here this morning in this church. I, I described standing in this altar and I described praise teams and choirs and pastors and congregations and radio programs and those Chinese tough and men and women, many who had been in prison and had never shed a tear during all that time. They wept uncontrollably and I asked them, what did I say? How, how have I hurt you? And, and they said, you don't understand. I, I said to them, uh, Ruth's not with me, so I don't know what I've done wrong. They said, you really don't understand? I said, I don't have a clue what you're talking about. Why you're so upset at me? And they got pretty hurt and a little angry. And they said, Dr. Ripken, which is the greatest miracle? That 100,000 Chinese are healed by God miraculously and maybe five or ten can figure out that their healing came from a God and maybe three or four can figure out his name is Jesus and find salvation through Christ. And you tell us that when you fly in to Jacksonville, Florida, you can call ahead and you can see a Baptist orthopedic surgeon on Monday. He'll give you x-rays on Tuesday, on Monday afternoon, Tuesday, a consultation and Wednesday, give you surgery. And you can do that 24 hours a day, seven days a week, which is the greatest miracle. We've already shared with you how 40% of our pastors are in prison, and you're saying that in this church here today, that if the pastor wanted to share the kingdom of God through the word of God for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, he doesn't go to jail. He doesn't lose his job. He doesn't lose his family. He, he, he doesn't get beaten. He's not going to be killed, which is the greatest miracle. You've watched us. Our knees touching together as we move our mouths to sing with no sound coming out. And you have these praise teams and you have choirs and you have radio stations and even TV programs where, where gospel, uh, God-centered, biblical-centered songs can be sung. And, and you can do that and you're telling me nobody gets beaten, nobody loses their family, their jobs, their health, their lives. Which is the greatest miracle, Ripken? You have seven Bibles, different translations on your desk in Ethiopia just for you. We have seven Bibles for 150 leaders, and you've watched us tear out a book by book so everybody can go home with at least one book of the Bible, which is the greatest miracle, son. And it was my time to weep. Because what have I called this that you have the today, this thing called church. I, I've called it, uh, I've called it normal. God forgive me, I've called it natural. And I've even thought of this thing called church as what I deserve. And God owes it to me. And if there's something that I don't like about this particular one, I can go find another dozen uh, to meet my needs and it's about my worship rather than about me opening an altar to God among my family, among my community, inside of my society. I wept like a baby. Uh, they relocated uh, your sister to St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, she sent me a contact number and I'd given her my email 
there in Central Asia. Ruth called her and brought her to where we were staying in rural Kentucky on a Baptist college campus where Ruth and I had met uh, a few decades ago. And uh, we brought her up. She met with the college students. And on Saturday, we took her to our church building for the first time just to introduce her to what it looked like, what it felt like, and describe how men and women will be sitting together. She's never seen that before, let alone seeing young men and young women sitting together and even touching who aren't married to each other and describe what that would look like. And on Sunday morning, we would never do this to her in her church. And I wouldn't do this in America now. Uh, we must reach Muslims. This is just a tip and gather them when they come to America as if they've never left their home countries. That's what's transferable back home for Hindus, for Buddhists, for communists, for former Muslims. And, and uh, uh, we took her to church and uh, she sat back over here with between Ruth and I. And that service started with a baptism unusual for that church of a whole family, a father, a mother, two teenage daughters, and, a, and I think 11, 12 year old uh, son, brother. And, and this young uh, Muslim background believer is sitting between Ruth and I and she's fidgeting and she's rocking back and forth and she's mumbling. And I thought she was having a panic attack by being in a mixed audience and sitting uh, around men that are not her relatives. And I whispered to her, it's OK if you need to go out. It's OK. Uh, Ruth will go with you and I'll catch up with you when the service is over. And she said in a loud stage whisper, I can't believe it. You're telling me that a whole family is being baptized in public and that man's not going to be killed. His wife and daughters are not going to be married off to somebody in a mosque, that they're not going to lose their jobs and lose their health and lose their freedom. She said, I can't believe this is happening. I, I think that I'm going to stand up and shout. I said to her, Stand up and shout, sister. If they kick you out, Ruth will go with you. And, and then she looked around at the congregation and, and, and puzzlement. And she says, why is everybody just sitting here? Why are they just looking down and around? If I was to go back to the Christians in my country and tell them what I'm witnessing right now, I would lose my entire testimony and my witness because no one among my people could ever believe that God could do such a miracle as this. Why are you just sitting here? Why aren't you standing up and shouting and clapping to God? Why not? Indeed. What an altar to God. He is open to us. And what do we call this this morning? We call this normal. Do you call this common? Do you call this what you deserve? Can you not see that in the, in the lives and the experience of believers in most of the world, they cannot imagine such a miracle from God as the altar that he has opened for us this morning. It's not common. It's not normal. And we do not deserve it. Wow. A window into their world and then a mirror that they hold up to us telling us how they Look at what God has done among us. Wow. Pray with me. Father, thank you for these grand and good people. Lord, it's been hard this past year. But Lord, we've seen your faithfulness and we have seen the way that you've even drawn us closer to you and closer to the body of Christ. Lord, help us once again open up an altar uh, uh, that's accessible to you among our family, among our neighbors. Help us, Lord, to cross the street with the gospel as perhaps a prelude to crossing the oceans. Lord, we just thank you for what you've done in our midst. In Jesus' name I pray. 
Amen. Wow, Nick, thank you so much for such a great word. Now, church, you know that every week at Urban Crest Online is Pastor Appreciation Week. So if you want to shout out Pastor Tom, you want to shout out Pastor Dave, definitely do that. We love those guys. But I think Nick brought an amazing word. And that brother should get an amen or a thank you down in the comments wherever you're watching. Facebook or YouTube, do it. If you're watching on the app, again, you could just shout at your phone, Nick, man, good job. I'm sure he'll feel it in his heart. <laughs> Now you guys, I'm going to throw you to one of our pastors who's got a very special message for you to hear. So listen close. Pastor Tom, all yours. Well, Urban Crest, it is great to have you as a part of our uh, missions conference this year. I'm holding up a copy of our Faith Promise Commitment Card. We've mailed these out to everybody we have an address on, I think in all of Midwest Ohio. I'm just kidding. But uh, these cards are so important to us in our sacrificial giving system to our missionaries. I ask you to fill cards out so that we can prepare a budget off of it. Now, if you've never ever looked at one of these cards, I'm gonna read it to you. Here's what it says. Urban Crest Missions Conference, an open door, Acts 14, 27. This is a faith promise commitment. In dependence upon God, I will endeavor to give the amount indicated towards the global evangelism effort of Urban Crest at Lebanon from March 14, 2021 through March 13, 2022. I understand I will not be asked for it. It is a faith agreement between God and me. My faith promise is, and then there's a commitment that you make there financially. You can circle whether it's monthly, weekly, or annually. And of course, if you're doing this online, then you can do the exact same thing. It is to be paid as the Lord provides. And so there's a spot there for your name, your address, city, state, and, and uh, zip code, and then your email address. These are crucial to us. I I'm telling you, it's hard to make a budget if you don't have the commitment cards that come in. And I realize some folks don't like to fill them out. And I understand that. But if you can, please fill one out. Do it electronically on the, what you're watching right now, or we've mailed these out. You can mail it back to, into us or your next service with it. You can drop it in one of the offering plates. Um, this last year, as I've shared in last week's sermon and even in a devotion I did this week, we took a pretty big hit. A year ago at our missions conference was when COVID was the big outbreak and things started shutting down and our sacrificial giving plummeted, to be honest with you. And yet because of the wise uh, stewardship planning of our Faith Promise Fund stewardship team, uh, we were able to continue to support every missionary 
uh, with their monitor support, all those things. There were some projects that we would have loved to have helped them with that we couldn't do. But as far as them receiving funding for their daily living expenses, all of those things have continued 100%. So I pray that you'll join Donna and I. Donna and I give every week. Uh, that's how we prefer to do it. Um, and I don't mind telling people, I challenge people, we give $50 a week to the Faith Promise Fund commitment. We're praying now about raising that commitment and what level will that be? We actually picked up another missionary uh, this last year that we personally support directly to them out of our church. But this, as we fill this out, we don't have any designation on this. And I want to encourage you. You can, yes, designate your funds to go to a specific missionary. But I want to encourage you, when you fill this commitment card out, leave it, just allow us to use it as the ministry uh, needs are there. Uh, Pastor Andrew and the folks with Stewardship Team, they have a really good pulse on this and the needs at the moment and those that are applying and needing extra help. So I just want to encourage you, don't bypass this. It's critical for us as we move forward in our missions department. Love you, church. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. And that's it. Easy, right? Well, thank you guys so, so much for coming one more time. Before you go, please like the video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell so you know when we are online getting to do the amazing things that the Lord allows us to do. And, you know, especially on YouTube, if you are watching this video, get in there and make a comment. It really helps out the channel and makes us just a little more visible to everybody else who's looking. So uh, please do that. It's really, really helpful. In the meantime, have a great day. Enjoy the rest of your week, and we will see you next time. Bye.